Um, next, we have uh, Mike Mesner um, giving a presentation um, about the economics behind this. And for the, the parks world, um, delving into uh, uh, the, the world of, uh, of Wall Street is, is new to us. And so we thought it was really important for you all to have a primer so that as you um, share information ab about the project, you are well informed. So, uh, Mike. Stuff. <laughs> where's, where's my guy Schwartz? Right here. And is there a way to? You just do it with the mouse, or do you? Is there a clicker on here? How does this sound okay? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in a little bit on why I'm here. Um, I was trained as a civil engineer and actually was interested in urban planning early on. I needed, when I needed a job, I migrated into finance and I never went to business school. Don't have an advanced degree in economics. I don't understand much about this new discipline called financial engineering. But one thing I do know is how to invest, how to make sure something built or purchase today will pay dividends in the future. And I do know after some very good investments in the 1980s and 1990s, this country has made some really bad investments over the last 10 years. This is a very important slide, and everybody should understand this slide. It's very, we tried to keep it very simple. We didn't put credit default swaps in there. We didn't put securitization in there. We didn't put all sorts of other things. We have basically have two uh, two measures here. We have um, the stock market capitalization on one side and mortgage debt outstanding on the other side. In, in the year 2000 and in January 2009. In the early 80s, uh, the PC was introduced, then came the cell phone and the internet. These technologies started an unprecedented revolution in information processing that substantially increased the productivity of the U.S. and the world. During the 1990s, the total return for the S&P 500 was 430%. So it basically went from $4 trillion to $16 trillion in that 10-year period. Wall Street was happy. Real wealth was being created. But when the technology stocks peaked in 2000, financial engineers on Wall Street thought they could create wealth through paper transactions. And Wall Street with the help of uh, the Federal Reserve's easy money policy, SEC's acceptance of some very questionable accounting, and the expansion of Freddie and Fannie Mae encouraged way too much investment in commercial and residential real estate. There was not much thought of, of the outcomes of these investments on Main Street as long as the bonus pool was increasing on Wall Street. So almost $9 trillion of residential and commercial mortgage debt was created and sold in just eight years, which was 30% more the entire mortgage debt outstanding in the year 2000. So this country had, for 2,000 year or 200 years, had peaked out at $6 trillion in mortgage debt. And, and in nine years, we increased it by 135%. Uh, one thing you have to understand, too, is that real wealth uh, is created when we can improve human productivity. Building bigger houses does not increase human productivity. So it's not a wealth generator. A bigger house is not a wealth generator. It's just a bigger house. Okay? Smartphones are wealth generators. The internet is a wealth generator. More revenue ton miles per track mile or per locomotive is a wealth generator. So the country is building 3 million homes a year when maybe 1 million were actually needed. We now have 6 million excess homes 
not including vacation and rental homes. And there are 19 million vacant homes, which is 14% of the total housing stock. Housing prices are now down 30% from the peak and are only leveling off in the short term due to major actions by the federal government to keep rates low and new buyers interested. The Fed is buying $1.5 trillion of mortgages to keep mortgage rates reasonable. Over 1.5 million homes have been sold with the $8,000 subsidy. Over 90% of new mortgages have government guarantees through Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginnie Mae. The U.S. government today basically owns or backstops the entire housing industry, which was unprecedented. Just 10 years ago, you know, the banks and the individual own this housing. Now it's the government. Now let's turn to commercial properties. During the late 1990s and through 2007, retail space was growing at 10% a year when their underlying GDP was increasing 3% or so a year. With easy money, leverage was encouraged in office, retail, and apartment financing. That encouraged short-term speculation, which caused U.S. commercial property to peak at $7.5 trillion in value. It is now down 40%, and it's unclear that that trend line doesn't look like it's bottoming here, does it? <laughs> so some interesting antidotes when it comes to this retail space. Between... Uh, between 1990 and 2005, retail space per capita doubled in this country, yet per capita spending increased only 14%. The U.S. has over six times as much retail space per capita as any European country. So now comes the Internet and online shopping. These numbers are actually probably too conservative. According to Forrester Research, about 7% of all retail sales were online in 2009. Online saw the biggest sales gain this holiday season, rising 15.5% from November 1st to December 24th. Retail e-commerce sales will grow at a compound annual growth rate of 9% from 2008 to 2013. More online shopping, the more dead malls this country's going to have. Sears is testing, and I just this was just, uh, I thought, indicative. Sears is testing a con concept called My Gopher that consists of converting an entire Kmart into a pickup-only site for internet orders, replete with a drive through Sounds like a lot of vacant parking lots. So vacancies will continue to grow. And they're climbing fast. Nationwide, over 10% of all retail space is vacant, equivalent to 25,000 big box stores. Including associated parking, this represents 150,000 acres of vacant land or a thousand more Piedmont parks. So then we go to the malls. I don't want you to get you guys too encouraged here, but <laughs> you got to think of this as an opportunity, okay? <laughs> I would just want you to know this is a massive problem on our uh, for our country, and there are no solutions that I think are going to be workable long-term that are coming out of Washington so far. Morgan Stanley recently did a study regarding the large regional malls like Lenox Square, North Lake, you'll all have them in your neighborhoods. The conclusion was almost 50% of the malls are weak now and should be torn down now. Another 20% are weakening, dis discouraging any upkeep investments. And they too should ultimately be torn down. So anyway, so now I have a couple, a couple pictures of some dead malls. Uh, you know, I think a good analogy between online shopping and retail space is the example I have highlighted on moreparks.org about automobiles and railroads. Like the commercial real estate market today, uh, in the early, by the early 1900s, the U.S. had finished a major railroad investment program. Then along came the automobile and truck, and railroads began losing transportation market share, just like retail fixed retail space is losing market share to internet. By 1940, it was apparent the U.S. railroads had way too much track in rail car investment. Rather than trying to keep those assets, railroads focused on the utilization of their best assets and systematically eliminated their overinvestment. The country, this country has eliminated 55% of its track in the last 60 years, 200,000 miles worth, enough for 30 cross-country double track lines. 
yet rail tonnage handle is up five and a half times, resulting in a 12-fold increase in rail productivity. Railroads have never been more profitable and efficient than they are today. And what it means is more assets don't increase a country's wealth. It's the utilization of those assets that increase wealth. And what's most interesting about this, too, for you guys to understand, I mean, over 15,000 miles of these access rail lines have been converted to trails and the rail to trails. And these linear parks are now being enjoyed by millions throughout the country. So it's actually can go hand in hand, you know, turning excess assets into more green space, more parks, whatever, will improve the profitability and utilization of what's remaining. So Atlanta's going to go through this probably a little bit more. But what was interesting is I was a graduate of Georgia Tech. I got to know Joe. You know, we said, let's, uh, I'd like to spend some research dollars in, in, in transformational infrastructure investments. So we went back and we started looking at things. And I said, well, you got to include major park investment program in this thing. And um, so we started with a what if for Atlanta. And I think everybody in the whole thing, including me, has been surprised at the magnitude of the problem in a city that's growing like Atlanta in terms of current vacancies, in terms of declining real estate values, and then the positive impact a major urban park investment program would have on a city like Atlanta. They're going to talk a lot about that later. But some interesting quotes that have come up lately, and these have been quotes from real estate people. We've seen the apogee of the big box retail. It's going to get ugly. Retailers are rewarded by Wall Street for opening stores. Now they have to ask, does another store make sense? And uh, the same guy spoke, said, his message to the Federal Reserve is you've got to densify your dynamite. If everyone consolidates into a fewer centers, what happens if the others become completely vacant? You take the dynamite and you change them. So here's a, re here's a, here's a developer who's basically saying, let's get rid of the stuff, and you guys can step in with park creation and really make an environment much better. I think this next slide is an interesting number here, is that developed real estate is selling less per acre in Atlanta than undeveloped real estate currently on the market. So in highest and best use, it sounds to me like you want to tear down the development and at least build a park or turn it into raw land. That's, that shows you the potential. Doesn't that, doesn't, that, doesn't that make you feel better? Why don't you go from here to there? <laughs> so this is, where, this is what frustrates me, OK? Let's, let's start thinking about what they've been doing right now to make sure this entire financial system, who invested so poorly into $10 trillion of mortgage debt, what they've been doing for them. They're not doing anything for people down here on Main Street. Federal Reserve has committed $7.2 trillion. FDIC has committed $1.8 trillion. The Treasury Department has, con has committed $2.1 trillion. I mean, these numbers are fluctuating, but whatever the way you look at them, they are massive numbers. And people say, well, this isn't real money. This is real money. You know, our currency is going down. Our uh, value of uh, <coughs> Our taxes are going up. It's sort of a, it all's tied in together. And, and, and when, when you're, it, it's, it's, not, it's not funny money. It really has an impact when you're trying to protect bad assets with a weak dollar. And that's what this country's doing. We're, we're protecting bad assets of overinvestment in real estate through the banking system with a, a sort of a zero interest Federal Reserve policy and a weak dollar versus the rest of the world. So they have all these special purpose vehicles out here. They have the TALF has this program. And I'm going to go through it a little bit. But I, uh, here's an interesting transaction. The FDIC all provided, and it's hard to understand, but the, basically the FDIC provided $2.4 billion in debt and $832 million of equity 
while private investors only put up $554 million for an investment in some of the FDIC property, which means the FDIC provided 90% of the financing for this private transaction. So I, this is what I'm trying to ask people in Washington. Why can't we get the FDIC to provide 90% of the financing for something that might be more worthwhile for our country than continuing to maintain excess condos out there? Here's some of the, the money that's out there. TARP, well, they say TARP is unavailable because it's too politically controversial. It's TAUP program by the Federal Reserve. They've allocated a trillion dollars. Only four billion dollars has been used to this program. There's this public-private investment program that's tied into the Treasury Department. Nobody has tapped that because no one wants to get in the way of declining real estate values. So I'm trying to get people to think outside the box, especially in Washington, to say, let's structure the ways a massive land purchase program can tap these sources of funding. Atlanta is thinking about how to create the right land bank Atlanta structure that can go and ultimately get funding from some of these sources. So anyway, in conclusion, I just want to say creation of mortgage debt has encouraged, encouraged overbuilding of non-productive housing and retail assets, which is really costly to our country. When I first started in the railroad industry, it was in 1981-82. It was right after there was a big incentive to build rail cars because we thought boxcars because we thought this country was short of boxcars. All of a sudden, the recession hit. I was, I was managing a rail car fleet in New England, and the entire railroad almost stopped because you just couldn't get rid of the boxcars. And it was very costly to have excess assets. It's not an asset when something is in excess supply and is slowing down the operations of a, of a business enterprise or an entire economy. Vacancies are costly. The vacancies are huge. Parks address the physical toxic assets undermining our financial system. And that's the most important thing. Everything that's being done on Wall Street and in Washington today is addressing the paper assets. There is no program out there to address the physical assets on a major scale. And this is what this program can be. It can address the physical excess assets on a major scale. And then this parks transform, as I said, this is a, we're trying to solve the real estate problem with a great output, which is more parks and it would be an, a positive output for the next 50 years to 100 years. So that's my conclusion. <laughs> that's where I stand. Any questions on any of this? Everybody understands it? I won't ask you credit default swaps or securitization or... Question, um, and maybe Catherine also. Just the question we get a lot is, what's your take? How serious do you think this prospect is? And what are the chances? Well... You know, I think there's so much political uncertainty out, out there in uh, Washington, and it's probably going to be more after today. Uh, so no one wants to get in the way of a new idea if they're not sure it's going to get through. We did have, every time I talk, the higher, the higher I talk to people, higher up in organizations I talk to people, the more they get it, and the more they say, get the structure together, get the ideas out there, get the way government can invest in these entities, and it'll happen. But no one wants to say, no one wants to champion it, it sounds like, until there's a real definitive plan on the ground. So we spent an hour and a half with the chief risk officer for commercial real estate for the Federal Reserve. And he had no problem talking about trillions. He had no problem thinking that if you had the right structure could come out, $500 billion to a trillion dollars worth of finance, it could become available for such a program. But I think he's, he basically said, you've got to, you've got to create the structures properly on the ground. You've got to get a little more support in the, in, in, on Washington, and you've got to get more support across the country. And once that happens, they've got the financing to help implement the program. And, and he had no problem talking about some of the programs they already have in place, about buying mortgages, TALF, these programs the Federal Reserve is involved with. You know, the Federal Reserve is just a big bank. Big banks own real estate. Federal Reserve could own park real estate, as far as I'm concerned. And there's no reason why that potential can't take place. Is 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's on the web, too. It, it's on, it's on moorparks.org. Right, it's on. It will be on the Redfield to Greenfield website. Uh, I'd also like to add that uh, we are working um, to uh, circulate the FDIC rules uh, regarding maximizing um, the return to have parks included as, as an exception. Um, so um, we're going to try to get that included in the financial uh, services reform legislation. The, we met twice with the FDIC people, and the first time they suggested there's a rule that's saying that FDIC has a, has a restriction that they have to maximize the return on their investment. Uh, when they dispose of assets. So with the exception that they need to promote affordable housing for people. So we're trying to add the exception, providing more parkland for people. And then the other suggestion that was made by FDIC is banks have this huge amount of outstanding debt on their balance sheet associated with real estate. They don't know how to get rid of it. There's no buyers for it. They're, they're thinking if you could create a mechanism where a, a bank could donate the property to a park or to a park entity or a nonprofit, and then they could sell the donation because they don't, they don't need the tax uh, exemption or they don't need the tax credit now. If they could sell the tax credit to a for-profit entity and then take cash in return, then you have a chance for a liquefaction effort by the bank and a chance for the land to be used as a park. real estate off the market and, and you know this kind of mirrors that when you look at it from a commercial standpoint and government kind of repeats itself a lot so I was wondering if you guys have looked at that strategy and what they're doing and how that might work. We looked at it initially actually when we um, we had a forum in September and we did an analysis of all of the, the federal programs um, that would be after you know in the path that would be applicable to what we're trying to do. Um, I have to say that we, uh, more recently, we had a conversation with uh, Shelley Satisha, who's at HUD, um, who will be hopefully the next director of the uh, uh, Sustainable Communities Initiative, uh, which is um, looking at, at those issues. And um, she was very supportive of the project. And, and so I think we have a link, but I'd love to chat with you more um, about who you know who could, who could and, 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 and this is part of the whole thing. I mean, government. The HUD doesn't talk to Treasury, it doesn't talk to FDIC, and they don't talk to the Federal Reserve, and nobody talks to the White House economists because the White House economists have all the answers. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, part of this effort, I think, is trying to make sure we know all the avenues and how best to match them all together into the right pathway for going forward. Right. I think the Atlanta team is really trying to, to structure a system that can potentially include banks as much more willing to give away or sell their real estate into an entity, as well as people willing to donate property into an entity. They're trying to create an entity that's going to be very flexible 
and being able to provide financing alternatives for some of these problem areas in the banking system. And I think that's one of the more interesting factors that's coming out of the whole Atlanta effort is try to create the right size land bank investment structure that can encourage a restructuring of land in a major, major metropolitan area. Yes. Yeah, I think that entity is very important because the question becomes, you know, you've used phrases like excess assets and land banking and wealth creating, and the issue is, yes, those are all, I think, very serious issues, but the question is, the land that's available that are essentially represent surplus assets are not always in the, same, in the best location for park use. And so the question becomes, how can you essentially broker the process so that you can uh, aggregate parcels and move parcels around so that you can essentially create the, the benefits of, of open space and park land, but then also convert other uh, vacant uses into more productive uses that, that, is, that are well, more wealth creating. So I think that this entity that can help to essentially negotiate that is, is going to be critical. Right. They're, they're trying to create a big pool on which they can just buy a lot of property and then decide at the bottom of the pool okay, this property is going to go into parks, this property is going to be redeveloped for this, this property, they're almost going to try to become a, a, a intermediary. intermediary, right. With, and not only in restructuring the land, but also providing the financial flexibility out there with the right type of paper so that people can trade easily. And there's not a lot of liquidity. And that is an interesting thing, too, that people should understand. The valuations that are down 45%, that's with no transactions. So we don't even know what the real clearing price is because when there's no transactions, no one knows what the real value of a piece of uh, a property is. It's probably inflated. Yes. Yes. This is pretty ominous. <laughs> and it's an opportunity. Right. What happens, two questions, what happens if you said, what we're hearing is that there really is no other plan out there need a structure, which you're working on. What happens if we do nothing? And two, what's our window of opportunity? Well, you know, time? sometimes I think about when you do nothing. Somebody from Japan uh, was in our office the other day, and he says, it's getting depressing in Japan because young people have no incentives or ambition anymore in Japan. I sometimes think if we do nothing and just let some of this stuff sit, it will just weigh on the whole culture. And uh, even if we can keep the financial system together, we just sort of weigh on the culture. That's just my personal opinion, but it, 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 it sort of hit home when this guy came in and said it's really getting depressing in Japan because, you know, an older teenager is like, it, it, has lost a lot of its ambition in life, which is what we don't want to see in this country. Yeah. On a slightly lighter note, um, just wanted to um, let you know, Colorado is the least opiate that have a transferable um, comprehensive research tax credit. A lot of less than start to want that. So that, if you're you know, talking about the, what your interest is, that's what you should ask. And also the, the bank side of this, just to make sure that it's not too bad. Going back to the tax credits, you think banks, depending on how they're structured, the tax structure that they may in, the tax credit does not have a lot of value. You say one of the things that we need to look at is how we syndicate those tax credits. Um, of course, the ta syndicated tax credits, when you think about it, in the housing uh, market, are depressed as well. I think we need to look at that model as well, which is the last 20 years syndicated tax credit. Reinventing that kind of structure would be very difficult for a specific project. So we need to dovetail with folks who already syndicated those kinds of credits. And energy credits are having difficulty being syndicated as well. So they might be a good partner because they're, they're struggling with the same issue of how do you sell those tax credits. There, there is a bill that's going to be introduced in the Georgia legislative for this session to make uh, the Georgia Conservation Tax Credit transferable, and that's one of the issues that we, uh, because of public land, have been running into working with some of the local banks on this very issue, uh, and it's really been a, been a pinch point. Um, you know, we're working 
under that program to help the bank uh, dispose of some of their non-performing loans, you know, to generate tax benefits, both in terms of federal and state taxes, deductions, and the tax credit. And some of the banks tend to use those internally, but it's been a real pinch point to, to monetize those right. tax benefits. And so if, if that gets passed and everybody expects it will uh, in Georgia this year, that will make a tremendous difference in terms of, and it's being patterned after the low-income housing tax credit program, too, which everybody does understand. Well, it's just 25 years, so you're not, you know, it's very, it's very complicated, but when it works, it works. You know, I was thinking when you mentioned that thing about uh, what happens if we don't do it, I was thinking about what would have happened to the railroad industry if instead of getting the railroad industry to divest of all this track, we created the Federal Reserve and Treasury said, no, don't tear down. We don't want you to tear down any track. We will backstop the track. I mean, the railroad industry would be just a complete mess. It would be bloated. It would be inefficient. It would not be at all able to serve it this country the way it's serving it today. And that's what happens when you protect assets that should be torn down quickly. It, it just slows, it just keeps things from becoming uh, the potential that it could become. I'm just wondering if I can hear how you got interested in trucks. Well, I'm sitting there in Wall Street. I'm seeing, first of all, these guys created Twelve trillion or thirteen trillion dollars worth of mortgages, and I, you know, we so, sort of saw it coming. I didn't make as much money as some people did, but you know, I survived pretty well, uh, all things considered, up there investing. Uh, and you start thinking, you know, they're just doing paper transactions. I mean, we you need a program that addresses the physical asset, the excess physical assets. And you start thinking, well, what can address the physical asset other than tearing it down and turning it green? So. It's not that I was, but I also am only a block and a half away from Central Park. I'm, I'm, we have a place in Pennsylvania that has a 450 acres of parkland right behind it. So, and I, and I also think back, you know, I grew up in Atlanta. I didn't have any parks around me in Atlanta. We moved to Boston, you know, and, and, uh, and then uh, Summit, New Jersey has some nice parks. And um, some of my family's best times were intermingling with people at parks or doing stuff together as a family at a park or whatever. And uh, you start realizing, you know, a city like Atlanta is, is, uh, is not fulfilling its potential if it doesn't in incorporate this type of part of the whole uh, living structure. Well, as I keep telling people, I say, well, one thing you got going for you is this problem's not going to go away, <laughs> okay? <laughs> These retail spaces are not going to get filled up anytime soon. We're not going to, everybody's not going to move into their house or their dreams anytime soon. Uh, so, but, uh, so that you have that going for you, but at the same time, Wall Street, or, or, or Washington is getting tired or, or, or I think the constituency is getting tired about talking about these big numbers. So if we don't get in touch and get in front of the situation and try to get access to some of these numbers that are already out there that aren't being tapped, then you might not be able to get them the next time around because people are going to be in such a revolt for spending any type of money at all. There's probably going to have to be another stimulus program. The unemployment rate is 10.2 percent. The underemployment rate is 18 percent. The job creation from the last stimulus bill was questionable at best. So close to 60 percent of the last stimulus bill supposedly has not even been spent. They allocated $40 billion to high-speed rail, and the, and the only one that's even they're thinking about is, is, is in California, where they wouldn't even be starting construction for 10 years. I mean, these aren't. These aren't stimulus programs. These are like long-term strategy programs. You know, tearing down stuff today and building a nice park today can be a stimulus today. And it doesn't need, you know, an environmental impact study uh, that's going to take five years. Okay.
Thanks all for coming. <laughs>